Hello guys, welcome to our online class for taxation. For today's session, I will be discussing income tax overview and income tax for individuals. So, I would like to apologize in advance if there will be any background noises that you will hear. I also hope that you are all still studying well despite the circumstances. I hope that you are staying healthy and safe. So let's go. First, I would like to give you an overview of what are the subtopics under income taxation, which are individuals, estates and trusts, partnerships, corporations, inclusions in gross income, deductions from gross income, and the installment method of reporting. For the general principles, I would just like to differentiate what is capital from income, and the theory of separability or severance test says that for income to exist, there must be separation from capital. So capital is just the return of capital, while income is the return on capital. And income is taxable upon realization, and income is considered realized when earnings process is already complete. One um, concrete example, that we apply is that when the business is selling goods then we apply the accrual basis of accounting but if the business is providing services then we use the cash basis of accounting there are also two types of income tax system namely the global tax system and the scheduler tax system for global it is also known as net income taxation wherein all income are added together and allowable deductions are deducted before subjecting to appropriate tax rate. An example of this would be those income that we subject to the graduated tax table. And for scheduler, it is also known as cross income taxation, wherein each type of income is subjected to its own schedule of tax. So, for example, we first categorize if it's an if it's on income subject to final tax or capital gains tax. So here in the Philippines, we apply a semi-global, semi-scheduler tax system. The status of income is very important to remember because there are certain taxpayers who are taxed only from their income within the Philippines. So for interest income, the situs is the residence of the debtor for the rent, the location of property, royalty is the place of use for dividend. I didn't notice back in undergrad, but if the dividend income is declared by a domestic corporation, it is automatically income within. But if the dividend income is declared by foreign corporation, we still have to perform a test wherein um, if the gross income of the foreign corporation is at least 50% within for the past three years, then the, the dividend income will be partly within and partly without. While if the gross income of the foreign corporation is less than 50% within for the past three years, then the dividend income will be wholly without. There is an illustration in the next slide for you to better understand that. But lastly, for the shares of stocks, we perform the incorporation test, or it really depends on where the corporation is incorporated for example if it's domestic shares then it's considered income within if foreign shares income without this becomes more relevant if for example the place of sale happened in a different country say for example shares of stock of Senegal corporation Senegal corporation in the Philippines is sold in the US then it will still be considered income within because San Miguel Corporation is a domestic corporation. This is the example for the status of dividend income. Mr. A, a non-resident alien stockholder, received a dividend income of 300,000 pesos in 2018 from a foreign corporation doing business in the Philippines. 
the following are the gross income of the corporation in the past three years. The question is, how much income should be subjected to tax? First of all, we note that Mr. A is a non-resident alien, meaning that he should only be taxed for his income within the Philippines. But the question is, is the dividend income of 300000 within or without? Since it is given by a foreign corporation, we perform further testing. And it's given here the past three years gross income of the foreign corporation. So I've provided the totals and the percentage. So for the Philippines, it's 60%. For abroad, it's 40%. As said in the previous slide, if it is at least 50% within for the past three years, then the income is considered partly within and partly without. That's why, as you can see in the answer, we prorated the 300,000 pesos by multiplying 60% and that is the income subject to tax. While the 40% is considered without, so it means that it will not be taxed because the taxpayer is a non-resident alien. What happens if, for example, Philippines only has 40% and the uh, abroad gross income is at 60%? So, in, based on the previous slide, if it is less than 50% within, then the income becomes fully without. So, the income subject to tax will be zero because the 300,000 dividend income will be considered without. Let's have an overview of the types of taxpayers, the individuals, corporations, partnerships, estates and trust. So first, let's discuss about individuals. We have five main categories for individual taxpayers. First, RC or resident citizen and RC or non-resident citizens. So these are those who are abroad with intention to reside therein, those who are abroad as an immigrant, those abroad for employment on a permanent basis, those abroad in whose employment requires him to be physically present therein for at least 183 days and those who are overseas contract workers who must be duly registered with PUEA. I easily remember NRC because I just think of them as OFWs. Next are A's or resident aliens. These are people with indefinite stay here or extended stay here and those who are not mere transients. Enra et B or non-resident alien engaged in trade or business whose aggregate stay here in the Philippines is more than 180 days. Enra net B is of course not considered doing business here in the Philippines. They are not entitled to any deductions. For special aliens, this is another category prior to train law but now they are already considered as resident citizens. This is for tax individuals based on situs of income. We all know that for resident citizens, they are taxed on income within and without. But for the rest of the individual taxpayers, they are taxed for their income within only. Note that a taxpayer may be considered a non-resident citizen and a resident citizen within the same taxable year. So, for example, if an OFW decides to come back mid-year here in the Philippines permanently, then for the first six months, he will be considered a non-resident citizen and therefore will be taxed only for his income within the Philippines. But... For the last six months, he will be considered a resident citizen and therefore will be taxed for his income within and without. Uh, next type of taxpayers are estates and trusts and they are treated as an individual as well. So estate, this is what um, the dissident lives behind after he dies and it undergoes true settlement. but if the state earns income 
then the estate will be taxed as if the estate is an individual. For corporations, we have three categories, domestic corporations, resident foreign, and non-resident foreign corporations. The NIRC defines corporations by enumeration, and my mnemonic for that is JPJ, to easily, to easily remember. First, joint accounts, partnerships, insurance companies, associations, and joint stock companies. These are not considered corporations however. GPPs or general professional partnerships exempt joint ventures and exempt joint ventures are basically those who have service contract with governments relating to construction projects and energy operations. Taxation of corporations based on situs of income, we also all know this. For domestic corporations, they are taxed for their income within and without. And for RFC and NRFC, they are taxed for their income within. Next type of taxpayers are partnerships. And I've also mentioned this a while ago, general partnerships are treated as a corporation because they form part of the definition of corporation according to the NIRC. However, GPPs are exempt. That's it for introduction to income tax. Let's dive deeper by discussing income taxation for individuals. And the goal here is to be able to categorize the type of income and then apply the appropriate rate for that income and then you should also be able to remember the general rules and the exception rules for different types of incomes. So these are the three types of income I will be discussing today and I hope that whenever you see an income you will be able to categorize it into one of these three categories then apply the appropriate tax rate so we will first discuss final income tax then what it is composed of and the special general rules same with capital gains tax and for regular income tax it will be more on the eight percent option the compensation income especially the minimis benefits and fringe benefits tax. Then after discussing these three, I will be discussing some filing and administrative rules. Let's first start discussing final income tax. It says here the primary liability is on the payer as a withholding agent and it is not anymore required to be filed on the IDR. So I know that you guys know what final income tax is. Pasok dito yung mga dividends, interest, royalties, prizes and winnings. And since it is already subjected to final income tax, then pag pinayaran yung income earner, it's already net of the income tax. Therefore, uh, nasa withholding agent na yung liability to pay and then it is not anymore required to be filed on the IDR. This is the whole overview of the relevant rates for final income tax. So as you can see on the first column, <clears throat> I enumerated the types of income subject to final tax. And then, uh, in isa isa ko per type of individual taxpayer, RC and RCRA, NRET B and NRENET B. So you just have to memorize the rates here. Yeah, you have to memorize it. And to note lang, the last one, the tax informer's reward, I don't know if this has been discussed to you, but I only knew about this during review, so I include this here. Uh, Tinataxan yung tax informer's reward. The reward will be the lower of 1 million pesos and the 10% of collection. And the rate on that is 10% final tax. However, these people are not entitled to the reward. They are employees, public employees. 
and their relatives within 6 degree of consanguinity. The first type of income subject to final tax is interest income from bank deposits, from deposit substitutes, from trust funds, and meron tayo rules on exemption for long-term bank deposits or investment. So, alam kong alam niyo na yung bank deposits. However, for deposit substitutes, I put some examples here. Bankers acceptance, promissory notes, repurchase agreements, government securities, and debt instruments. And for the last bullet naman, meron tayong rules on exemption except for NRNET B. Meaning, this rule does not apply for NRNET B. The rate for interest income earned by NRNET Bs shall remain to be 25% regardless kung short term or long term. However, for other types of taxpayers, namely resident citizens, NRCs, RAs, and NRAET Bs, mag-a-apply sa kanila tong rules on exemption. If uh, the bank deposit is earning income and the bank deposit is long term, at least five years, then it shall be exempt from final tax on interest. If it's only four to five years, the rate is 5% instead of 20%. If it's three to four years, the rate is 12% rather than 20%. The requisites for long-term bank deposits are the following. First, it must be issued by a bank, not a non-bank financial intermediary. You will immediately see that in the problem if it will comply with this first requisite. Second, it must be in the name of the individual and not of the corporation, the bank, or trust department of a bank. Therefore, it excludes corporate bonds and notes. You have to be careful here. Um, I have encountered problems wherein sinasabi nila na may long-term bank deposit in the name of blank. So, you just have to note that it must be in the name of the individual for it to be subjected to the rules on exemption. Third requisite, it must be in denomination of 10,000. This is just good to know meaning at uh, hindi naman kailangan sabihin sa problem na denominated in 10,000. Okay? We assume that the investment is denominated in 10,000. Uh, maturity and actual holding period must both be at least 5 years. So, ayun nga, nasabi na yun sa period in the previous slide. If 5 years and above, then exempt. If 3 to 4 years, um, if 4 if 4 to 5 years, 5%. If 3 to 4 years, 12%. And then, the special rules are on interest income. Interest income from CARB is exempt. This is the same as CARL, I think. I also mentioned that during the discussion of real property taxes. And then, interest income from members of credit co-ops is exempt. Interest income of OCWs and deposits under EFCDS jointly held with a resident is 50% exempt, 50% taxable. So, if ever you encounter a problem wherein uh, there is a bank deposit under expanded foreign currency deposit system held jointly by an OCW or an OFW and, for example, his wife, which, who is a resident of the Philippines, then we tax the interest income. Uh, we tax 50% of the interest income while the remaining 50% will be exempt. Next type of income subject to final income tax are royalties. So the general rate for this is 20%. And then 25% for NRNET B. However, if the royalties pertain to books, musical, and literary compositions, then it will only be taxed at 10%. The next type of income subject to final income tax is dividend income. 
So only cash or property dividend will be taxed because stock dividends are not considered as income. This is also aligned with how we record stock dividends uh, in accounting. Diba? We only enter a memorandum entry when we receive stock dividends. And then share of individual in the after tax net income of a partnership or joint venture is considered as dividend income. So it's very obvious kasi kapag corporation. Pag corporation na give out ng dividend, then that's dividend income. However, it says here, I'd like to point out here na if for example you are a partner in a partnership, then what you receive from the partner from the partnership is considered a dividend. Okay, so you apply the rules on final tax. Next type of income is prices. The rate for this is 20% but 25% for annual net B. It will only be subject to final income tax if it is more than 10,000 pesos. Otherwise, if it is less than or equal to 10,000, then it will only form part of the regular income, which will later on be subjected to the graduated tax rate. I noted here that if uh, the same individual won prizes from different sources, then each uh, prize will be subjected to the 10,000 threshold separately. The prize will be exempt if, number one, it is uh, sanctioned by the National Sports Commission, and number two, if this is relating to relig uh, religious, charitable, educational, artistic, literary, and scientific prizes, subject to two conditions. First, the individual has no participation to join. Second, the in, uh, there is no substantial future services to be performed by the individual. So, for example, uh, you have been aw awarded because of um, a discovery or an invention na hindi ka naman sumali. Talagang inawardan ka lang or nirecognize ka lang and you have no substantial future services um, for that organization, then it will be exempt. The last type of income subject to final tax is winnings. So if this pertains to PCSO winnings, then if it's less than 10,000 pesos, it will be exempt. In comparison to the previous slide, if it is pertaining to prices, kapag less than or equal to 10,000 pesos, di ba sinasama natin sa regular income? However, if PCSO winnings, if less than or equal to 10,000, then it will totally be exempt from tax. And winnings we refer here uh, pertains to all winnings except winnings from horse racing, which is subject to OPT. Note, prizes versus winnings, ang pinangkaiba nila yung prizes, mayroon certain criteria to qualify for the prize while winning. This is out of pure luck. Okay guys, so we are done with final income tax. Let's proceed to capital gains tax or CGT. So capital, meaning that this pertains to capital assets. Normally, the sale of capital assets should be subjected to rules on capital assets and shall form part of the basic tax. Later on, I recall natin what are the rules on capital assets, but I would just like to point out that under capital gains tax, mayroon lang tayong dalawang transactions. So, all other transactions relating to capital assets, ay i-apply natin yung rule on capital assets. So, CGT is also a final tax. And mayroon lang tayong dalawang transactions subject to CGT. First type of transaction is the sale of share of stocks of domestic corporations. So if these are owned by foreign corporations, 
it will be subjected to regular income tax. It should also be held as capital asset, meaning hindi siya held by dealer in securities. Kasi yung dealer in securities, ang inventory nila ay share of stocks. And again, pag form part of inventory, then it's already considered as an ordinary asset and not as capital asset. So, otherwise, kung dealer in securities ang may hawak niyan, it will also be subjected to regular income tax and VAT. And last, uh, it should be sold directly to the buyer and not through the local stock exchange. Otherwise, if sa local stock exchange yan, it will be subject to stock transaction tax. Okay? Except for the following. Itong dalawang uh, circumstances na to ay as if sold directly to the buyer. First, the public company did not meet the minimum public ownership required by BSP. And second, even if it's through the local stock exchange, but the buyers were already predetermined and therefore there was no public involvement. The second type of transaction subject to capital gains tax is sale of property. Again, it should be held as capital asset. Ibig sabihin, hindi siya used in business. And it should be located in the Philippines. What transactions are exempt from CGT? So first, the sale of principal residence. Second, sale of land for socialized housing. And third, transfer of land under Carl. So, supposedly, these three transactions pasok siya dun sa second na diniscuss natin from CGT, which is the sale of real property held as capital asset. However, uh, they are exempt by law. So, yung first one, there are, there are certain criteria to be followed strictly for it to be exempt. First, the property you are selling is supposed to be your principal residence. So, this is to be certified by the barangay captain. Second, the proceeds to be utilized for the purchase, the, the proceeds should be utilized for the purchase or construction of another principal residence. So, for example, you're selling your principal residence for 10 million pesos, then you should use the same proceeds to purchase or construct a new principal residence. So, if you are not able to fully utilize this, then um, we compute the normal uh, capital gains tax and then we prorate it using the proceeds not used over the total selling price. So, for example, out of the 10 million, you've only used 6 million to purchase a new principal residence. Then, we compute the capital gains tax that should have been due and then we multiply it by 60%. And that will be the capital gains tax that we will pay to the PIR. Third, the utilization must be within 18 months from date of sale. This is the utilization of proceeds, okay? And fourth, the BR commissioner must be notified within 30 days from date of sale. And lastly, the escrow account must, an escrow account must be established equivalent to the CGT supposed to be paid. So this is just like goodwill. As to sale of real property to the government, even if um, it is a forced sale, then it will still be subject to CGT. However, the taxpayer has the option to be taxed uh, using the graduated tax rate or the 8% option. Or the taxpayer may also choose to be taxed at 6% capital gains. So the option to choose is only for individual taxpayers and not available to corporations. For the capital gains tax rates, uh, for the sale of share of stock, the tax base is the net capital gain, meaning you have to deduct the cost of the stock and then you multiply it by 15% 
and then for sale of real property the tax base should be the higher of fair market value or selling price multiplied by 6%. And we are down to our final type of regular income tax for individuals. So we are done with final income tax with capital gains tax. And for regular income tax, the main focus will be the 8% option and the minimis benefits and fringe benefits. These are the type of taxpayers relevant for the regular income tax. First is the minimum wage earners who are always exempt on their SMW or statutory minimum wage plus H2ON, which are the holiday hazard pay over time and night differential. I would also like to point out that an employee who has two or more employers each pay him the statutory minimum wage will remain to be an MWE. Next is purely compensation income earners, self-employed professionals or individuals, and mixed income earners. For mixed income earners, they are earning compensation and um, from, from their self-employment. Let's discuss on what is the 8% option for regular income. First, there are certain conditions that an individual must comply with in order to be entitled to this option. First, the gross sales or receipts plus other income does not exceed 3 million pesos. So please remember that um, the basis would be the gross sales or receipts plus other income. The option is automatically not available to compensation income. Individuals who has income subject to OPT other than the 3% OPT under section 116. So if you remember OPT guys, we have um, a lot of transactions subject to OPT. The first one would be the catch-all. Sinasabi doon na for businesses not subject to VAT and does not exceed the 3 million threshold then uh, he shall pay the 3% OPT. Yun po yung section 116. So for example, if you have uh, a business of land transportation, which is subject to the 3% common carrier tax, that's OPT section 117, then you are not entitled to the 8% option. Next, this is also not available to VAT registered persons. Persons enjoying tax exemptions like the MBEs and partners of general professional partnerships. Also, uh, the individual must be must have signified the intention to avail in the first quarter return. The eight percent tax is in lieu of the graduated tax rate and the OPT. So, if a person availing 8% income tax exceeds 3 million throughout the year. So, for example, um, he signified the intention to avail in the first quarter and has, pay, and has been paying the 8% tax, but uh, during the year, the individual exceeds the 3 million threshold. The first 3 million shall be subject to 3% OPT, which is to be collected within the month following the threshold was breached without penalty if it is timely paid. And then the excess of 3 million will be subjected to 12% VAT. And then the 8% tax that has been already paid shall be allowed as income tax credit. This is another way to remember how 8% option is being applied. So for purely compensation income earners, this is not allowed. Because as you have seen in the previous slide, uh, the 8% option is not allowed for compensation income. For self-employed individuals or professionals, it is allowed. And uh, the base would be cross sales or receipts plus other income minus 250000 For mixed income earners, they are also allowed. But the tax base will be 
gastos or receipts plus other income lang. Bakit wala ng 250,000 deduction? It's because mixed income earners, for example, are also earning compensation income. Then, dun sa compensation income, which is being subjected to the graduated tax rate, incorporated na yung 250,000 doon sa graduated tax table. So, if you remember the tax table, yung first 250,000 of your um, income will be exempted from tax. Let's proceed to the minimis benefits, which is composed of 11 benefits. First, monetized VL not exceeding 10 days for private employees, monetized VL and SL for government employees. So to compare the two, for private employees, may limit tayong 10 days and VL lang. However, for government employees, there is no limit as to the number of days and kasama yung SL or sick leave. Medical cash allowance to dependents is 250 pesos per month in total, and this is not to be multiplied uh, per the number for the number of dependents. Medical benefits is 10,000 pesos annually. Rice is either 150 kg sack of rice or 2,000 pesos monthly. Meal for OT or graveyard, not exceeding 25% of the basic salary. Uniform and clothing, 6,000 pesos yearly. Laundry, 300 pesos monthly. Employee achievement awards must be in kind for it to be considered as a de minimis benefit, which is 10,000 yearly. Gets during Christmas and major anniversaries. Uh, 5,000 yearly. I think major anniversaries is only 25 every 25 years. I am not sure. And uh, lastly, productivity incentive schemes under collective bargaining agreement or CVA, which is 10,000 yearly. Note, for married individuals, they shall file consolidated ITR but computed separately and they shall be liable solidarily. The minimis benefits are excluded sa paghanap ng um, income subject to tax. And then the first 90,000 are also excluded which comprises the Christmas bonus, productivity incentive bonus, loyalty awards, gifts in cash or in kind actually received, and the minimis benefits exceeding the limit. So if you are to compute for uh, the taxable income of an individual and there's, uh, there's compensation, there's the minimis benefits, you exclude the de minimis benefits. And then for um, if the individual also received bonuses, loyalty awards, gifts in cash or in kind, and then yung excess ng de minimis, yung kaninang binasa natin na, tre na threshold, you will first um, pull it and then subject it to the 90,000. So kung hindi siya nagsid ng 90,000, then you don't have to include the bonuses uh, mentioned here in computing for the taxable income. Fringe benefits are benefits given by the employer to their employees, but only those given to management supervisor employees are uh, subject to fringe benefits tax. So for rank and file employees, it will only form part of their taxable income. So fringe benefits tax is also a type of final tax and therefore um, those who receive the benefit uh, doesn't need to report it as part of their taxable income. So on the point of view of the employer, the actual benefit that they gave to the employee plus the fringe benefits tax that they're gonna pay is considered the allowable deduction. For the rate, um, for RC and RCRA and NRA at B, the monetary value is divided by 65%. And then you multiply it by 35%, that's the fringe benefits tax. And for NRA net B, 
you divide it by 75% and then multiply it by 25%. The most common fringe benefits um, have him a hell. I think you have also heard it from Dr. Onda. I only added S for the stock options I will discuss later on. Pero isa-isahin natin just to recall and I would like to add uh, the exceptions here as well. So for pag ako nag-exempt, ibig sabihin it's not subject to fringe benefits tax. It is a fringe benefit. However, if it suits the criteria, then it will it is no longer subject to fringe benefits tax. First, housing, except awarded to officials of AFP, housing within 50 meters of business premises, and housing that is only temporarily given, which means it does not exceed three months. Expense accounts, except related to trade or business, and duly receipted in the name of the employer. Note that fixed representation and transportation allowance are part of taxable income then vehicles household personnel and then interest 12 percent versus actual so for example um, you loaned from the company and then instead of paying 12 percent they just um, charge you six percent so the difference of six percent will form part as a taxable fringe benefit. Membership fees in social or athletic club. Educational assistance, except kapag binigay sa employee, the educational assistance is related to business and there is a written contract to render service for the company. And if the educational assistance is given to dependents, it must have been provided under a competitive scheme for it to be exempt. Holiday expenses, expenses for foreign travel, except the cost of business or economy class ticket. But if the ticket is first class, only 70% is exempt. All inland travel expenses and lodging costs of, of up to 300 US dollars per night. So for example, the company allowed me for a foreign travel to Singapore. So the cost of the ticket, my plane ticket, if it's business or economy class, will be exempt from fringe benefits tax. But if uh, they book me a first class ticket, then only 70% of the price will be exempt and the other 30% will be taxable as fringe benefit. And then all inland travel expenses. So if I'm already in Singapore and I had to travel from place to place there, then all of those expenses will be exempt. And for my lodging, for example, a hotel, um, the first 300 US dollars per night will be exempt. So anything above that will be taxable. Life and other insurance in excess of what the law allows and the S stock options. At grant date, it is to be recognized at fair market value and at exercise date, the higher of fair market value and book value versus the exercise price. So the exercise price is normally low, lower than the fair market value. So the higher of FMB and book value versus the exercise price will be considered as fringe benefits subject to tax. We know that the monetary value is relevant for us to come up with the correct fringe benefits tax and computing for the monetary value is a bit more complicated for housing and vehicles but for others it's very straightforward. So I have made a table of summary on how we determine the monetary value. So this is how to read the table for the first item. If the property is being rented by the company for the use of the employee, the value will be the rent and then we multiply it by 50% to arrive at the monetary value. Then when we arrive at the monetary value, we now divide it by 65% and multiply it by 35% to arrive at the fringe benefits tax. I will leave you the other items of this table, but just 
to note um, a pattern I've seen is that if the use is being provided for the employee only the use and not the ownership that's when we usually multiply it by 50 percent but if we pass if the employer passes on the title of the property to the employee then that's when we multiply it to 100 percent That observation is also true for vehicles. As you can see here, if only the use is provided to the employee, we multiply it by 50%. And then if the title is being passed on to the employee, we multiply it by 100%. So if you can see, we only have different bases. And then there are instances when we need to divide it by five years or 20 years in the case of housing. Exempt from fringe benefits tax, those that are necessary to the trade or business given for the benefit or advantage of the employer, contributions for retirement insurance and hospitalization and premiums paid for group life insurance. So for the first two, uh, for example, that there is an engineer that needs to be on site all the time, then the company provides for the housing, then it is given for the benefit or advantage of the employer, and therefore this will be exempt from fringe benefits tax. A special rule on fringe benefits, if the basis is fair market value or acquisition cost based on the recent tables, then the, the fringe benefit expense is non-deductible but only the fringe benefits tax. Uh, the excess of fair market value over acquisition cost is deductible. We are almost done for income taxation for individuals. And now let's proceed to the filing and other administrative rules that you must know when it comes to income taxation for individuals. So I have provided here a summary of different forms and deadlines relating to the incomes we have just discussed. So passive income, income subject to capital gains tax and uh, income tax return, which shall be filed quarterly and annually. And I have provided here the name of the forms relating to different types of taxpayers. These are the individuals that are not required to file ITR. First, minimum wage earners. Second, those whose income doesn't exceed personal and additional exemption. This is of course prior to train law because now we don't have personal and additional exemptions. Those whose income doesn't exceed 250,000 pesos. Those individuals whose sole income is subjected to final tax and those qualified under substituted filing. So those, these are purely compensation income earners during the taxable year who only had one employer and the tax due for the individual is equal to the tax withheld by the withholding agent. And the spouse also should have complied with the above three requirements. These are the persons qualified under substituted filing and the system goes like this, the, employers, the employer submits a form 1604 to the BIR and then the employer provides form 2316 which is the certificate of withholding to the employee as uh, the receipt or proof of payment of the tax. The rule on payment of income tax is generally pay as you file. However, if the tax due is greater than 2,000 pesos, it may be made into equal installments. The first one is during the time of filing and the other half is on or before October 15 following the close of the taxable year. So for example, your tax due for the taxable year 2018 is 100,000 pesos you may uh, pay it into equal installments. The first 50,000 will be at the time you file, for example, 
April 15, 2019, and then the other 50,000 you should pay on or before October 15, 2019. We also have the electronic filing and payment system by the BIR and through several revenue regulations that has been issued by the Bureau, they have required some um, companies to file under EFPS. So among others, the top 20,000 private corporations, top 5,000 individuals, large taxpayers, corporations with paid up capital, stock of 10 million and above. So this is how you determine if the taxpayer is large, either as to payments or as to financial condition and results. So you just read through this. I don't think that they will get this technical, but these are good to know. You can see in the table on the upper right for the filing reference. If you already have the filing reference number, then your um, return is deemed filed. If you already have the confirmation number, it is already deemed paid and acknowledgement number, then the payment has already been credited to the government. EBIR forms, on the other hand, these are downloadable and this may be online. The ones using this are usually accredited tax agents and their clients, accredited BIR printers of receipts, GOCC, LGUs, one-time transaction taxpayers, those who file no payment return, cooperatives, registered with NEA and LWUA. For the place of filing, authorized agent banks, revenue district officers or offices, collection agents, and duly, duly authorized city or municipality treasurer. You should file two copies, but however, you should prepare three because the other one is yours. And if you're filing through an agent bank, you should prepare for. Other things you have to remember, those uh, who are required to keep books, hire CPA and submit account information, are taxpayers whose gross sales or receipts exceed 3 million pesos, and they should preserve books and invoices for three years. I would also like to discuss a brief overview of our withholding tax system because again withholding tax is not tax in itself but it's a system of the government to better facilitate the collection of taxes so withholding is made by the payer of income if the pay and the income are taxable it only covers specifically enumerated transactions by law Final withholding tax is full and final and not any more part of IDR, while creditable withholding tax will be allowed as tax credit. Time of withholding is the earlier of when income is paid or when income is accrued as expense on the part of the payer. If the payer fails to withhold tax, he may not claim the payment as an allowable deduction. And these are forms issued by withholding agents. So as I've mentioned earlier, Form 2316 is given to employee, while Form 2307 is given to vendors or suppliers. That concludes my lesson for income tax overview and income tax for individuals. But then again, guys, this is more of a compressed review. So I hope that you have taken down notes and after this, I hope that you answer some exercises from your textbooks. I will try to provide some relevant exercises to test your knowledge about this, but I will do that in the week to come. So I hope that you've learned something new or you have been uh, reviewed of important concepts for income tax. I'll see you again soon and stay safe.